Good evening, everybody. I'm Richard Greenhouse, the chair of the National Centre for Universities and Business. And it's my great pleasure just to thank Ruby. And I'm going to do that in a little while because we're going to have some questions first. But what I took from that, and it was, it was so rich a text that you had, is that the kind of idea that um, it may be uh, somewhat easier in new businesses uh, but that we certainly need some new mindsets and new mindsets of ambition, I think. Your example of schools, I think, is so telling, really. Uh, and above all, in, in, in established businesses, I think often a new culture. I remember from my Unilever days, I was thinking, sitting there, I've got a few examples, but I won't tell you them all. But one of them that comes to mind was when Niall Fitzgerald was running the detergents business. And with two colleagues, ex-colleagues from Unilever in the room, perhaps remember this, but we had a disastrous period when competition with Potter and Gamble. And Niall came in on, with his, on a Monday morning with his team and said, right, well, how many of you did the washing over the weekend? And nobody said yes. And they were all men. So, of course, there are two things you can put right there. You can get your men to do the washing where you can start to build a team which has got more uh, women marketing managers and product managers. And of course, he did the second. I'm not sure whether the first happened as well. <laughs> anyway, let's have some questions. Um, I know we've got two which have come in already. Jan, you're, you're one of the people who's going to ask a question. So why don't you go ahead, wait for the microphone, and just if, if everybody, anybody who asks a question just says who they are, that will be really helpful. Hi, I'm Joanna. I'm from BA Systems. I, my question is, what role do you believe employers have to play in improving the quality of career guidance given to young people, especially women in schools and colleges? Sorry, I didn't hear half of that. Just say that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, what role do you believe employers have to play in improving the quality of career guidance given to young people, especially women in schools, colleges and universities? I think we've got a huge role to play. We encourage all our people to be part of the Inspiring the Future programme, which encourages individuals to go in and talk about their jobs for an hour a year, um, go in and discuss what they do and actually bring work to life. I think, you know, I can say this as um, a mum of two teenagers, school is very different to the workplace um, and the transition does take time and can be quite tough. But um, it's really trying to get kids to understand what jobs are in, in different places. I think it's a massive, it's massive. But it's actually really hard for businesses, large and small, to work out how to do it well. I think one of the challenges we have is that we're all so busy. It's one of those things that we all know needs to be happen. I think it should be, you know, I'm really hoping that the whole educational sector will really take this because as kids come out of, of schools and universities, um, you know, they should be supported onto that next phase, not just left to say, well, we've done our piece. Okay. it's really important they're supported in terms of where they then go and what they've thought about. So I think it's massive, massively important. Right, let's take some more questions. Um, up there, um, you. Hello, I'm Sarah Main. I'm from the Campaign for Science and Engineering. Um, I... <coughs> Our organisation is quite interested in talking to government about things that they might be able to do that influence some of the things that you've touched on. I just wonder, from your experience, are there any one or two things that you think are within the gift of the government that, that could be done to possibly influence um, the, the situation you'd like to see in terms of diversity in business? Yes, I think there are one or two things that could do that could be quite different. I'm really passionate around fle I mean, flexible working is in business today, but I don't know how embraced that is. And actually really supporting great flexible working, I think in business would help a lot of individuals and help different types of talent rise to the top of business. Um, and I do have a real thing around childcare for families actually, not just for women, but actually I think the lack of affordable childcare in the UK is causing a real issue to my talent pipeline and everybody else's. And I think it's making individual, both men and women, make different choices because it is just so expensive um, in many parts of the UK. So I think there are specific things you can do. Um, 
I think there are specific things the government can do. And what they should do is focus just on one or two of those things and really make a massive difference with them. Now, I know they'll say there's no money, but we've got to spend some money um, on something. And this, I think, is a really useful area to spend it on. Thank you. All right. There we are. Another one along the, the row. My name's Holly Elson. I'm a journalist at Times Higher Education. I wonder if you have any thoughts on what universities could be doing specifically to support graduates in this area. I think, again, it's to the collaboration between business and universities in terms of, you know, better support around work placements, paid internships, really collaborating with local businesses of all different sizes. Um, and, it, and it does happen in some areas. This is not something that doesn't happen at all. But to, would I say it, I see it happening consistently across the UK? No, not at all. Um, we certainly don't sit much, much in our sector. Maybe our sector is still quite young. We're not well known. We do employ 10% of the UK workforce uh, between us all. And yet no one really thinks about going into outsourcing as a career. It's something my sector needs to do something about. But you can imagine we're not the most loved sector at times as well. <laughs> so it's uh, quite interesting. But I think the tradition, you know, Br Britain's changing in terms of the jobs that are on offer. Technology is changing rapidly, the jobs that will exist in the next two decades. And I think there's got to be some really big thinking about the, how that collaboration really works. Because I don't think today it's fit for purpose, not for the next generation. Shall we move down here? My name's Malcolm Skinglaw for GlaxoSmithKline. So are there any other countries that have got better working practices than the UK that you've seen? I think you do. You see, you see different, um, different examples in different European countries. I think you see... I think careers advice is lacking as a whole. I don't, I've not seen any great examples anywhere where you could be particularly wowed by it. You could certainly be wowed by certain things in the US on the way they're thinking through flexible working. But I think, you know, we shouldn't underestimate the scale of the challenge because the challenge, particularly around, around women in leadership roles, is, yes, the US, I think, is better in certain areas. There's a big debate about whether you should have quotas. I personally don't... I'm not a great fan of quotas. So I, I don't think that gives you the output you want. But I am a fan of aspirational targets and actually saying, well, if you have a workforce, for example, that is 50-50 male, female, then what is your plan to make sure you have that at every level of management? And we're not there in our business. No business is there yet, I don't think. Not that many are. Um, and how do you make sure you don't just do that as a quick fix, actually you make that really consistent. But that's why I think it starts from actually when kids come out of school, which you can't just magic the, the change in aspiration and what people want to do. You've got to, you've got to teach them young. Hmm. Let's go up that side now, shall we? <clears throat> Keep your hand up, then that's it. Hi, uh, Melanie Washington from Stepnet. Um, <clears throat> I think we shouldn't underestimate the impact that parents and teachers can have on choices of young girls. I just wondered what, um, if you had any ideas or what your view was on how we can engage with parents and teachers to help inform your girls on the choices that they have? I think it's, I think, personally, I think it's quite difficult for teachers because I think they're so busy. I think, well, well certainly a lot of the teachers I speak to would love to do more, but they don't have the time. Um, not quite part of your Ofsted um, examination requirements, is it? It's not the most pressurised thing on their list. They're, they're pretty short resource. And I actually think you need to put a lot more funding into career guidance to help teachers. Um, I think it's unfair to expect them to be able to do everything. They're there to teach in a subject. They can't be everything to everybody. Um, and I think they need a lot more support. In terms of parents, I think um, that's a really good point. We, at the Women's Business Council, we came up with some really good ideas around parent packs to really help them to understand the range of opportunities that are out there on careers. But again, I think you ought to do that in a joined up way through great careers guidance that works not just for kids, but for their families too. And I think, no, I don't, I don't underestimate the role of parents in this. Um, 
but uh, as a parent myself, even I would, I struggle to, you know, I'm, I'm great at talking about finance, okay? I'm not going to be able to talk to my kids about the route to get to everywhere if, if they like different things to finance. As it is, they seem to like finance at the moment, don't they? <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ruby. Uh, Julius Weinberg, Vice-Chancellor at Kingston. Uh, one of the things I've been challenged about recently is that I should not be narrowly thinking about appointing the best person for the job. I should be thinking about appointing the person to create the best team, which I think has forced me to rethink what I do. Uh, it'd be interesting to hear your reflections on being appointed to a team when, as you said, you perhaps weren't ready to do the job and needed support, and whether you continue to take that view forward within your organisation, and how do you balance that best person, best, best team uh, issue? I think if you've got the best person, they'll find a way to have the best team, personally. Um, because I think if you put the best person in any kind of leadership role, they're going to be really good. They should only be there if they're great at building a great team. Because my, I mean, I can't only do what I do with a great team around me. I don't do most things in my team. If it wasn't for my, for most, you know, we're a, we're a great team of people delivering a set of, of outcomes for our group. Um, but we've all got to be good at managing and managing a managing people is all we have. But really, we've got to be great at building teams. If we can't build teams, we're not going to build a great business. So I see them. I see them as the same thing. Can we move across to the other side over here? Right, there's a question here. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Lynn Matthews from EDF Energy Campus. Um, I'm looking very much around the Nuclear New Build. I manage the Education Skills Program for Nuclear New Build. And one of the things that we're really um, starting to identify is with universities, um, actually working with universities to uh, maybe work on the curriculum. So when the, the young people come out, that maybe they're more aligned to our needs. Have you started looking at it in that area rather than just relying on, on what's coming out? What are your thoughts on actually start, starting to influence curricula as, as a group of industries? <coughs> We've taken a, a slightly different view at MITE, which is that I'm not sure how much I can influence the curriculum, but um, we spend the first year with our grads, basically them making them work ready, which is not great. So it's almost like a year before we feel they're ready to be in our workplace naturally. Um, and that's where I think more can be done. But I think it's quite difficult. It depends on your sector and what you're in. If you're, you know, if you want to influence the curriculum, I think in one or two areas you can. But I would struggle. I work across 12 different sectors, so I would find that quite difficult to do. So we sadly have had to take the approach that they're not work ready. We'll have to accept they're not work ready. I have to put a program in place when they come in to make them work ready. And which, again, I think you can work on a lot of that from pre-university at school. Because a lot of it for me is around actually understanding if you want to do really well in business, you've got to work really hard. Work ethic's an interesting example of actually explaining to young people, it's not over when you leave university, that's kind of when you start. Um, and it's really hard work. Um, hard work means hard work. Um, and getting them to, you know, the small things, being good at presentations, being really, um, you, you can imagine in an industry like mine, service industry, being responsive, being able to speak to people. Those are not always things you're going to learn through a university degree, but through your entire education, you would hope more time could be addressed to those things, because actually they're all great skills to have. But I think we still at school focus very much on an output that is just literally academically focused. But It'd be really great if they could chat a bit more when they turn up as well, you know, and actually be a bit more, um, you know, actually have been, you know, supported if they're quite shy. But it's amazing what we have to do in year one. So no, no curriculum change from us, no. Good evening, Ruby. My name's Priya and I've just graduated from the Cisco Apprenticeship Scheme. And I just wanted to get your views on the evolution of apprenticeships and how you see apprentices 
um, playing a part in breaking down barriers? And do you have any apprentices at MIT? You know, we have a few hundred apprentices at MIT, so we are massive fans of apprenticeships. Um, I would say today I think they are as important to us as they would be for a graduate. I would say when we work with our apprentices, it means by the time they've worked with us for a while, um, I'd say in many cases they're better than the graduates we are. Um, I think the, work, the fact that they've worked in the workplace that they're really excited about doing a job of work, I think means many, many, many kids today are better suited to, to doing, apprentice, doing an apprentice route through a business than um, necessarily going to university first. So I think it's massive. So for us, I mean, we have a lot more. We have, we have around 500 apprentices across the group, um, which is a lot more than new grads that we would take on. And um, again, we also think in terms of commitment, in terms of helping us support the group we're trying to grow, we feel they are more committed and longer term employees. So a huge fan. <laughs> okay, just a lady in the third row. Michelle Salinger, consultant, you, and I must say Priya was, used to work for Cisco, and Priya was model apprentice, and actually made a video, hey. <laughs> <laughs> made a video for the um, Bucks UTC to encourage more women into IT with one of her colleagues, so I want to say thank you for that. <laughs> um, I think you, you've picked up a lot of systemic issues. Um, you've talked about um, aspirations, you know, the girls that you talk to don't have those aspirations. Career service in the UK is pretty much dead and teachers are, are responsible for careers and we should have a proper career service. And also people tend to recruit like people like us. Um, and you, you've picked up on all of those. Um, do you do leadership training? Is leadership training maybe one of the ways in which you can address these issues by identifying men and women who come <coughs> into your organisation and give th and, and recognise them as leaders early on and push them in that direction and support them to get there? Because I think unless you change some of these aspirations, you're, it's going to be very difficult for things to change. You know, we we um, we like others have. Um, we put a lot of leadership training in across our businesses, and particularly with a lot of our kind of young rising stars, put a lot of mentoring, support, leadership training around them. Um, and also give them quite large jobs so that they get put into pretty high risk environments when they're pretty young to make, and even if they make mistakes, so be it, they need to learn. Um, I think business is really risk averse around doing that. I don't think we are, we probably go to, more than another extreme. But I think we are less hierarchical. So our view is if someone's really great, um, then we will fast track them through to do some really, really interesting roles in our business. Um, and we're quite large so we can do that. Um, and I think if you do that, then I think again, you know, our, our view is we'll end up with much better leadership over the next decade, the more of that we do. And actually we've been doing it for quite a few years and I think it works really well. Super number of questions. And, um, just come back up here, Steph, would you? There's a lady at the check top. Okay. Green Art and Dubrava University of Bradford. Rudy, um, Ruby, sorry. Uh, I want to ask you what is your view in terms of businesses encouraging their employees to learn during their life? Because the business environment is changing extremely quickly and they need to learn more and more during their working life and that also applies to women who after a career break might need to change completely uh, their career in terms of other career paths. What is your view, please? I think it's incredibly important that we all believe we can all still learn and that you know, the, the business environment is changing so quickly, there are, there are always things you can learn more for. We've certainly sent a lot of our young rising talent back to one of the business schools to do additional work on leadership. Um, we've, you know, from supporting MBA programs to whatever else it may be that we choose to do, we are massive supporters of that. I think in terms of growing a really great business, um, we shouldn't underestimate how much development our, own, our people need. Um, and again, I think 
you know, a lot of the universities have been really supportive of that with us. And we've got some people going through some great programs at the moment. Um, and I think the more of that that's offered, the better. You know, for me, university, you know, going back and working with one of the business schools for some of my MDs, I think is really important. Really important. Um, should not be underestimated. Now, it's Tim Stevenson here. I think you have a question. Well, you can almost shout it, but we'll wait for the, wait for the microphone and then... Um... My name is Tim, I'm from the University of Leeds. Um, I'm part of the NCUB 50 under 30 sort of young leaders uh, group. And one of the things we're looking at is uh, finding mentors or coaches to drive us through. And I wondered if there was anyone in particular that inspired you to become a leader, or is there anything in particular that you learned that you probably didn't know when you were a fresh graduate out of the university that you, that you wish you did? <laughs> <laughs> I'll answer. The, so, so in terms of um, the people that have supported me in my career have been really incredible. From my first chief, actually, no, I'll go back to when I was trained to be an accountant. One of the accounting partners that took me under his wing to tell me I could do okay in accountancy, even though I didn't enjoy audit. Um, through to the first chief exec I worked at at Circo, who told me when I was around 30, that actually I could run it one day, which I was quite surprised about. Um, and even though I never then did, and I left. But, but, we, but what was interesting was I, I took great comfort from people supporting me and telling me that I was actually capable of doing well. And I think that we shouldn't underestimate how powerful that is with individuals, that telling people, do you know, you really are capable of great things is not something they appear to hear very often which I think is a massive shame, which is very good in business, aren't we? You do 360 degree feedback, and most of it's around criticisms. It's never about why you're really good at what you are. So I would say the people that have supported me um, in terms of the people I've worked for have been fantastically supportive and encouraging in terms of making me better at what I do every day. And in terms of things I wish I'd learnt when I was 21, um, I didn't have the confidence to believe I could do really well. I wish I'd had the confidence um, that I kind of now have, because I think confidence would have really held me back in my 20s in a big way. Um, and self-belief, because no one ever actually really told me that I could do well. And I, I think for me that, that was an issue. I think also um, the other big thing I wish I'd known was it's okay to make mistakes, because we all make mistakes every day anyway. And on the basis of we're always going to get things wrong, not everything goes right in business every day. You just have to accept that getting things wrong is part of what happens every day. And learning from that, I think, would also have been really useful. And taking more risks. Maybe you're, to be risk averse. You're, asking, you're answering a whole load of questions. Are we okay to carry that's on? Fine. Because there's still a lot of hands going up in the room, and that's, that's great. There's one just behind you, and then we'll come back down here, because I know... I'm Rebecca Chalawad. I'm the business dean at Parkson University. I think one of the issues for women often is um, ageism, in the sense that women often in their 20s and 30s are very busy with young children, and it's not until they hit their 40s, or even older, that they're able then to really commit to a career. Um, and I've seen several women at that age, they suddenly get a second wind, and, and they do very well. I wonder if you, and yet often at that age, they're considered to be a bit past it for um, really good career promotions. I don't know if you have any comment on that. I think it's... I don't think it's about your age. I think it's about, um, it's about your mentality, actually. I think it's around, you, you, you know, you've got to be young in your mind and be prepared to embrace and change all the time, particularly in a very, very, very quickly moving, fast, dynamic business environment that's changing rapidly. You know, I remember when, you know, I was off on maternity leave with my second child and suddenly it was the world of the internet and dot com here. By the time I'd got back, everybody had a website. I didn't know what a website was. You know, I, you know, it was the catching up with technology quickly, being prepared to embrace and change, I think really matters. I think you're right. As, you're, as, as my kids have got older, I've certainly found it easier. Um, and I have a little bit more energy now than I probably did when they were smaller um, as well. But I think it's around, I think it's not your physical age so much, actually. It's around the mentality of what you believe you can do. Um, I meet a lot of women 
whose kids are growing up, who, whose biggest issue is how do they get back? They're massively talented. How do they get back? What support could they be given? Because the amount of untapped potential in women as they do get older, having had a, a bit of a career break because actually they wanted to, which is absolutely right, if that's what, you know, we should all do what we want to do. Um, I think, again, it's a big untapped market. There's, you know, we're beginning to see different organisations really... Um, targeting women who want to come back after a long career break, support training, um, support bringing them back into the workplace. I think that's going to be more and more important, particularly in a world where I think flexible working is very much our future. You know, the days of office bound, this is how we do things, they're almost over. Just come down here, Steph, would you, and a couple of hands coming up. My name's Wendy Bowers, I'm the representative for uh, Female Enterprise with the British Chambers of Commerce um, and I also run an organisation that is building a network of 500 ambassadors across the UK to mentor the next generation of female leaders. Um, I'm in that um, age group that we've just been talking about and um, it, the thing that's very difficult for me is that I'm coming to the end of um, 20 odd years of raising four children and thinking that I'm just going to see the light because the youngest one is 16 and now my mother's got dementia so we're starting with that. Um, there's a lot of people my age that are dealing with that um, and in the main these people are women. Um, what do you think we can do to start changing society's perception that it is the women that always is the main carer? Because I think until we really start to change society's perception around that, we can't change the place of women in the workplace. I think it's a really tough challenge as you get older. You know, as, as all our parents get older, we, we begin to have challenges in, in terms of needing to support them. Um, I don't think there's any easy answer because to change society perception is going to take a long time, a long, long, long time. But equally so, I think, again, my points around flexibility in the workplace will really help, because actually employers can help here by saying, kind of, flexibility is all right. You don't have to be here every day. If you need to go off, go off. I remember on my, on my first shareholder roadshows, my son was star of the nativity play, and Ian, my boss, said, go home missed the last meeting and I was so excited but I felt so guilty about going best thing I did um, but it was um, and actually what did I really miss not a lot I think once you actually get business to the place where they say look we can give you more flexibility we get it we don't need to judge it okay it is what it is I think business will be better for it and I think you'll have employees that are far happier and happy employees makes for a good business but I, society is a tough, it's a, I wouldn't know how to deal with that. Um, Jenny Halley from the National Physical Laboratory. Uh, my question is actually linked to uh, society's perception of women as the carer, um, but slightly more focused on, on a young family. I'm, I'm a mother of a 10 month old son. And um, what could businesses actually do, perhaps even with universities together, to make it a bit more acceptable that when the obligatory phone call comes from the nursery <laughs> to pick up uh, the little one because he has uh, not been very well, that it's actually also acceptable for fathers to take up that particular role. Um, it very much is focused on women and flexible working, but I think there might be something that we can do actually to, to support fathers in the role as well. Most of my direct reports are male, and they're, quite a few of them have got young children. They have that issue, and I'm kind of, you have to be pretty laid back about it, male or female. Um, child's <coughs> ill, child's ill. Maybe it will help, actually, when, um, when more boards are a bit more family friendly. <laughs> it's a reality, because I don't think a lot of them are. Um, I get it, because I've... It's happened to me, and it's done. I think every chief exec needs to get it, and everyone that leads a business needs to get it, and I've been through it. Um, and if your child's ill, you've got to go and get them, and there should be no judgment passed about that at all. That will come. It's certainly there in my group. Um, it's only a question of time. I find it quite ridiculous that anybody would, would find it a problem if someone had to go and pick up a child because they weren't very well, male or female. May next to you there, and then we'll take one, one more. Over here. Hi. Isn't it? 
Hi, Ruby. Uh, I'm May Bush. I just work with the president of Arizona State University, and I'm also a uh, coach and have my own business here, so an entrepreneur like yourself. I loved what you said about the people that took you aside and said, you know what, you could really be somebody. Uh, you, you didn't use those words. You used much more eloquent words. I'm, I'm curious about the times when you pull people aside now, because I'm sure you're the kind of person that pays it forward. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering what you are looking for in those people that, or what you see in them that would make you feel comfortable to make that kind of religion statement? Or maybe what did they see in you when they made that statement God. to you? Um, real drive, determination, um, great, pe great with people. Um, more than anything, that people want to work with them. There's no, I always say to my people, um, you've got to be great because no one's going to want to work for you if you're not great fun every day. Um, the simple things in life, nobody wants to get up and work every day for someone that's really miserable. They want to work for someone that makes them feel happier during in their place of work. Otherwise, you don't build great businesses with very miserable people, is a really simple thing I would say. So drive determination, a great <coughs> sense of fun, positive thinking, I think a real sense of positive thinking, not giving you problems, giving you your problems, then saying, but guess what? I've come up with three solutions. Great solution drivers in business, because you need that as well. Um, and, and also, I will, tell, I, I will tell people in my business, I'll particularly focus on those that don't necessarily see how good they are and, don't, and are always prepared to give me the five things they've got wrong as opposed to see that's what they've really got right. So I try and phrase it with people when I talk to them, say, look, these are the things that are really good first. Um, then maybe, by the way, you want to focus on X, Y, and Z to get a bit better. But I think it's those sorts of traits you look at. Um, real positivity in business, I think, creates great leadership. Um, nobody, and I certainly never wanted to, wanted to work for any team that just had a downer on life every day. <coughs> Yeah, last question over here, and I've got just two, two um, Twitter questions here, which if I don't ask, I'll be in real trouble, Ruben. Is there anybody over here who'd like to ask a question? Hi, Ruby. Um, I'm Jennifer. I'm from Cisco. I was fascinated and very inspired to hear that you took two years out uh, as a career break. You know, personally, I didn't take any time out with my three kids, but I did back off. And what I felt was that there was a perception that I had checked out, and that was terminal. And I wonder how, and, and, and it wasn't, and I got back, <laughs> checked back in again, um, you know, once my kids were at school and I could, I could cope a bit more with the pressures of having three kids. But I wondered how you handled that perception of, oh yeah, you know, she's gone. <laughs> it was pretty awful, actually. I remember, um... Then my phone stopped ringing, and most people didn't want to talk to me anymore, which I, I thought it, I think it's, um, the best thing about it for me, actually, was how much it, how, how much it levels you to realise that actually when you're out of the workplace, no one's really interested, um, no matter how good you might think you are. So, um, for me, it was actually a, um, a really interesting experience to go for, and it did make me very cynical when I then started my new job all that time later when the phone started ringing again, and I was thinking, oh, no. So it, it taught me a lot. Um, I found it quite hurtful. Um, I found it quite difficult. Um, but equally so, um, what I did learn was that there are great, you know, from your friends and your family who really support you through that, the people in life that really support you um, in business are those that will there, be there for you in good and bad times. This wasn't bad. I was taking some time out. I did a bit of part-time work. I went to the gym a lot from memory when I could. I seemed to spend a lot of time building train sets for my little boy, but you know, I did all the things I wanted to do. Um, and it was really hard coming back in um, and explaining it, but um, I kind of just took the view that's what I had to do because it was right for me. And if people couldn't accept me for that, then I didn't want to work with them anyway. Now then. Um... How would you respond to claims that women have to act like men to get ahead in business? I think we know the answer, but we'll hear it from you. <laughs> I don't really know. I wouldn't really know how to act like anything but myself. So I would say um, 
I don't think it's necessary, and I think it's a massive shame if any female feels they have to. They should just be themselves. Okay, very good. How do you keep your eye critical when you've been in leading the same organization for many years? <laughs> I'm not sure he said so many years. <laughs> Surround yourself with really good people who um, who keep you very, very current and don't allow you to have any kind of ivory tower around you. Occasionally, I wish I did have. Um, and um, you have to be the kind of person that stays down to earth and doesn't begin to believe their own hype. But most of the people around me make sure I certainly don't believe any of the hype. So. Okay. <laughs> well, Ruby, I think we'll we will we'll draw this to a close. Um, Thank you so much. I was listening with such intensity to what you said, and we covered an awful lot of ground. I was, I was thinking of my own personal contacts. And the most recent one is my daughter, who's a hospital consultant, uh, said that she said to her six-year-old boy, Joe, I, I've now been able to change my hours, so I, I'm taking Tuesday off. And he said, well, why, Mummy? He said, well, I can spend more time with you. But you see me on Sunday, he said. <laughs> <laughs> She's taking the Tuesday off, don't worry. <laughs> um, I think this has been, David, uh, a unique lecture this time because it's been so much about you and your experiences and very personal experiences and the whole you, so not just you in business, but you outside as well, that um, I found that really interesting and genuine, genuinely inspirational too. Um, so I shall be following your business with great interest because I'm sure that under your leadership it's bound to continue on its upward path. So thank you very much for coming tonight and we've thoroughly enjoyed having you here. Thank you.